Pink's I mean, good. Oh, good. Oh, my golly. Yeah. I think the sound is all Pink. People. Brilliant, brilliant. We just arrange our artefacts on the, on the table. But wonderful. Great to see you all. I'm, I'm John McMahon. I'm Head of Education here at the RSA. It's my really great pleasure to welcome you all to the great room for today's very special, special Christmas event. And hello to everyone joining us online as well. Uh, it's great to have you with us too. Brief word about the RSA. Uh, we're a home for world-changing ideas and debates since 1754, with a modern-day mission to inspire collective action to regenerate our world and secure just and flourishing futures for people and planet. We're really thrilled to host this event to mark an exciting new adaptation of The Dark is Rising, co-produced by Complicite and Catherine Bailey Productions for the BBC World Service. Um, it's a really kind of personal pleasure as well. I'm, I'm a, a last minute stand in his chair. I think many people might have been expecting Nikki Baby. Unfortunately, she's not been able to join us due to being unwell. So we, we send her well wishes for a speedy recovery and a, and a, a wonderful Christmas. Uh, I'm, I'm a big admirer of Susan Cooper's work, a big admirer of the work that the men on stage that we're going to be talking to as well. So wonderful to be able to stand in uh, for this conversation with Robert McFarlane and Simon McBurney. Just before we hear from them, uh, a, a reminder that there's an opportunity to get involved in the conversation later. We're going to open up for questions from the room for Rob and Simon. Uh, and also, if you're watching online, you can share your questions in the YouTube chat uh, or also on Twitter using the hashtag, the dark is rising. We'll try to get through as many of your questions as we can, uh, aiming to wrap up at two o'clock, but we're gonna, we're gonna plow through. As I mentioned, this new adaptation of The Dark is Rising uh, has been commissioned by the BBC World Service. Just before we de uh, dive deep into, into the full conversation, it's my great pleasure to invite Simon Pitts uh, from the World Service to say a few words about the project. Got a microphone, that's yeah. good. Come on up. Thank you very much. And um, very nice to see everybody here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, uh, the, what we're going to be hearing about from Susan Cooper's book adaptation is about honouring the ancestors. And in that spirit, um, I'd like to tell you that today is the 90th birthday of BBC World Service, and we commissioned this piece of work. <laughs> it really is quite an achievement. 1932, on the 19th of December, the Empire Service, as it was then known, started broadcasting with a program budget per week of £10. <laughs> um, we exceeded that a little bit with, with this one. Um, World Service um, back then was this incredible um, sort of broadcasting phenomenon. The Soviets understood it, the power of broadcasting. The Catholics understood it. And then uh, Nazi Germany understood it. And uh, BBC expanded in wartime to uh, not just broadcast in English, but in other languages, Arabic, for example, and, uh, and became part of the sort of uh, um, effort, really, in the rising, against the rising dark of, of Nazi Germany. Um, BBC had always brought in the best and the brightest collaborators. And after the war, one of uh, Hungary's exiles from Nazi Germany came in to world service, a guy called Martin Esler, and then went on to become the BBC's head of radio drama and set about what he called, created, set, set about creating what he called a national theatre of the air. So important was drama to the sort of storytelling wealth of the BBC's output. Um, the BBC's output being based on trust, integrity, honesty, trying to get it right, and truth seeking. Um, we, I, I met, uh, I, I'm responsible for arts and cultural programming on, on World Service, and I met Simon a few years before the pandemic. We met in a cafe in New York, and I think we talked about fathers for a bit. And out of that, we created some sort of trust, I think, which is absolutely crucial, and then a beautiful program from Simon for us for an hour. Uh, and now this extraordinary series. If you stick with it, and I really, really hope you do, you will discover, I hope, 
that this is the richest audio production that you are likely to hear. Um, you have to go back to a classic like something like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy many, many years ago, who some of you in the room will know, uh, for the sort of evocation of a world and the intensity and the richness of that. And, I, and the, the, the people in this room who have worked towards that, uh, Amber and Tim, people who can't be with us, Catherine, the production staff, Noah, who's here, some of the cast, who are incredible, have done a, a most amazing job. So anyway, um, that is all to say, um, 90 years on, nine decades of, of storytelling and trying to get it right, uh, it couldn't be a better time uh, for us to present Zuckers Rising. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. Really delighted to have you here with us today, Simon and Rob. Simon, I don't know if you're expecting to be the star guests at the 90th birthday party at <laughs> the BBC, but really wonderful. So, as you all know, Rob is a, a beloved writer of books, uh, works of film and music about nature, landscape and literature, from the old ways to uh, recently the lost spells. Simon is a hugely respected and acclaimed creative force in the arts, uh, an actor, poet and playwright, and founder and director of the influential avant-garde theatre company Complicite, who have produced this wonderful adaptation. So, great to have the opportunity to speak to you both about this amazing adaptation of Susan's work. We're going to kick off by playing a short extract from the first episode, just to summon up some of the atmosphere uh, and feel of the story, and also the sonic treatment that you've given it in this production. Um, Rob, would you, would you like to tee this up for us? Uh, in, in terms of uh, what we're about to hear. Yeah, gladly. Um, hello, everyone, and thank, thanks, Simon. Yeah, what a birthday uh, celebration. It's wonderful to be part of it. So uh, the, the clip you're about to hear is, is, is about a minute long. It comes at the end of the first day, at the end of the first episode. And young, young Will, played by, by, by Noah, uh, he knows something's wrong now. Um, the, 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 the landscape is awry, creatures are responding strangely to him, the weather is, is building without breaking, there is, there is menace hanging heavy in the air, and he, he is trying to sleep and hope that when he wakes up, normality will have returned, and that is not the case, and you're about to hear him gripped by the fear, and then a sudden event. The first wave caught him as he scrambled out of bed. It halted him stock still in the middle of the room. I can't move. The rocks. The trap. Fleeing. And then the image of the attack was gone, and he was released. Nothing's wrong. Everything will be. All right, if only I can stop thinking and go to sleep. It shall be your birthday when you wake up. Oh, frightened of the dark. How pathetic. Look, there's the bookcase and the table. Everything's ordinary. Just go to sleep. Will still tossed uneasily. The feeling was growing worse every minute as if some huge weight was pushing at his mind, trying to take him over. And then into his mind came a dreadful darkness, a sense of looking into a great black pit. And the fear jumped at him again, like a great animal that had been waiting to spring. I can't move again. I, I'm going mad. Going mad. mad. <laughs> Okay, that's the first time I've heard it as well, so I guess for anyone familiar with the work, just how that brings it to life. Also, I'd like to kind of note the kind of binaurality of it. This might be, this is better than my home stereo, definitely, but the effect that people can hear and also wonderful voice performances from Simon and, and Noah, who's here with us this afternoon. So, Rob, Simon, let's, let's go back to begin with 
to when you first encountered this story? Who would, who would like to go first? Well, uh, I, I, I encountered it through Rob, so I think Rob <laughs> should tell the story of, uh, of his um, relationship with the book first, and then Rob introduced it to me a few years ago. And um, I started, we, he was doing a, a read-along on Twitter, because it begins on the solstice, and then it runs every day through Christmas. And so I started to read it to my children who are at the back there and they were absolutely gripped and the consequence was we went on and read the whole quintet but Rob can tell you about how he encountered it. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I mean, it's one of those books which you meant, oh, have you read The Darkest? Oh, the Darkest Rising. Like, there's so many people met it early or, or met it later and have not forgotten it. It sinks into the bones and it sank into my bones in, in 1989 um, when I did read it un under the bedclothes and I still remember the little mini mag light torch that I gripped in my teeth <laughs> so that I could, <laughs> I, I could light the page. And, uh, and it, it, it just has kept coming, coming back, uh, changing its shape as time uh, and life change their shapes in the way that, that really great books do. And I led this uh, co-led with um, Julia Bird, a poet, uh, a Twitter read-along and the, the, you have this sort of double real time going on, the real time of the novel, and then the real time elapsing in, in, in the reading of it. And that's, this is, was at the heart of our idea of the adaptation. And thousands of people joined from all over the world. And at the end, so I think it's very important that we hear Susan's voice. She can't be with us today, but um, she sent this wonderful letter to all these thousands of people who, who joined in this real time read along. And, and although this is five years old, I think it speaks to what we hope to achieve with with the broad with the adaptation so it's it's I, I'll, I'll cut it short but um uh clearly i've always had a deep attachment to the winter solstice to the turn of the year to old and new christmas this year thanks to all of you that haunted space has had an extra power for someone who pulled up her roots when young and has felt like a piece of flotsam ever since i wrote the dark is rising out of hiraeth the welsh word longing for home it has meant home to me ever since and always will. And hearing how much it has meant to you all in so many different ways has been overwhelming. Writer, reader, when our imaginations speak the same language, we can change each other's lives. For all of this, I'm humbled and grateful. And that speaks to us across a distance of five years, but I think rings in the moment as well. I gave a copy to Simon when I understood that he had never read this, <laughs> this extraordinary, life-changing novel. And you can take up the story there. Well, um, it's a book that, while it is perhaps aimed at young people, has a much wider appeal, a much broader application. And it's fascinating to hear her say that it comes out of a longing for home because at its heart is a sense of profound sense of place and there is the actual topography of Buckinghamshire where it is set but the feeling is when well, it's not just a feeling but there's a sense in which the, 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 the story reaches round the globe mm. uh, there is an interconnection with um, uh, Jamaica, there is, uh, uh, and, and the sense that th this is a, a global struggle rather than a local one, and that any myth be a deep seated myth like the myth of Arthur and the knights and Merlin and magic and so on may emerge out of one particular place but is actually in common to all human consciousness at the base we are myth and mythic creatures and the way that that is presented in the story is both extraordinarily eerie and strange and frightening and 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 deep but at the same time absolutely every day mm. and that's what for me was uh, uh, so beautiful and i think for my 
children too, is you, you are in the everyday mm -hmm. and at the same time suddenly touching the eternal or the universal or the deep past and the possible future. Um, uh, uh, yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Something like that. <laughs> and Simon, you've already um, invoked the Twitter read-along and since then we've, we've been through a pandemic and many other things yeah. beside over recent years and when collective experiences of story and song become a unifying and protective force against rupture or isolation or exile, did the experience of the pandemic seep at all into your creative approach for this, uh, for the retelling? Well, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's that, that aura that we're not yet out with of, of the pandemic. It, it inflects everything, I think, still, uh, and it certainly inflects this this novel, uh, there is, when Will leaves the house, he wakes on midwinter morning and looks out of the window and sees the snow that has changed the familiar world absolutely. And then he walks out into it and it's as though he's walking into a locked down landscape. No one else wakes, there, there's no one else to be seen, no tracks. That, that out of kilterness, that, that kind of the, the mismatching of the acetate sheets that be became stronger and stronger and stronger as the pandemic gripped us tighter and tighter, um, it's there. And then, of course, we're, we're, we're now living through a, 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 a financial crisis. There are people in this novel huddled around fires. Warm spaces are being created for communities, for whole villages where shelter can be taken with with others. Um, heat must be kind of n nurtured, nourished and protected. Uh, and then there's always that, that disjunct, which I, I see as the real engine of the novel between the, the, the kind of cosy familial domestic and the, the eerie askance, awryness beyond it. Absolutely. Oh, and so sort of flowing from the pandemic, the book does also speak to us of ecological crisis and the confusion, the dread of kind of, you know, massive systemic changes in, in weather and in yeah. climate. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also the, the hope for, uh, you know, how we can move through that. There's a beautiful line through rereading, which I, I kind of noticed. Each wave of men uh, in turn grew peaceful uh, as it grew to know and love the land so that the light flourished yeah. again. Also, um, in, in, in this kind of pivotal moment of, you know, kind of uh, an unexpected and sort of deadly deep winter, that really speaks to us of, of the cost of living crisis that people are experiencing now. And there's even this line about people leading a restless, enclosed life like cavemen in winter and went to bed early to save fires and fuel. Mm -hmm. So, Simon, Rob, what are you hoping to connect to people's lived experience of the now through, through this work? Well, I think um, you've s s said it all. Um, um, uh, it's all there, but I, uh, it, 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 there is a, a... The struggle between the light and the dark, as it is written in this book, is one of a, an extraordinary mythical story and Will has this quest to go on and he has to get all these signs and gather and then it ends with an enormous uh, uh, conflict which isn't the end of a conflict and the other thing to say is, is that the, uh, it's called the light and the dark but uh, there's a huge amount of ambiguity in the sense of sort of, you know, the, the, some of the characters who are associated with the light are actually quite cruel and yes. ruthless in their determination to get what they want. Uh, and the dark is, a, you know, particularly the, the, uh, um, the black rider um, uh, he is a very, very curiously described mm. character with orange hair and blue eyes and very, very... So it's, nothing is quite expected. But I think in answer to your question, for me, it's like a... Um, when we were reading, it's such... Um, Although this, this extraordinary quest and adventure, it actually touches on an inner darkness, an existential darkness that we all 
feel. So although it's a story, actually it's about our mm -hmm. inner worlds. The timeless world is our inner world. Our inner worlds are timeless. We live in two times, the time of our consciousness and then the, uh, uh, you know, the time of the clock and then the time of our consciousness, which is very, very different. So we all have, and I think when we're young, when I, um, you know, when I, w w with, with, with my children and when we've been playing and actually my youngest daughter, Mamie, still, um, when she plays, she enters this incredible timeless place. And it is timeless. At uh, the same time, as, uh, at the same moment as, as, as what we can still, still uh, feel within our dreams, within our conscious imaginings. So there is, yes, it's, a, it's an extraordinary story, tale of real physical things that happen, but at the same time it touches something very deep within, and that's part of the eeriness mm -hmm. of it, wouldn't you say? And yeah. so the struggle, this existential struggle of light and dark, which is something absolutely contemporary right now, because, I mean, I, I think we all feel uh, a, a sense of, of tremendous sense of growing darkness and a sense of sort of impotence in face of the enormity of it. I mean, we only have to look at our current government to go, my God, what can we actually do against these forces of darkness that are uh, overcoming us, you know? Um, and and it, they are very, very... Uh, um, yeah, there is great darkness now, I think. Uh, and there is a, a, an existential struggle that it speaks to, yes. Yes, and um, the power of disinformation and twisted words within this and the other books in the sequence is very kind of present as well. And uh, Rob, is there anything you would like to say to this, to this theme? Well, uh, I mean, I was, ex I was very frustrated with the, with the weather gods uh, that they did not grant us uh, <laughs> a, a synchronous hard snow and coming of the ice beginning basically today and then and then a hard thaw which has actually happened today c kicking in around uh december the 29th so yeah thanks guys but um, we can we can hold that experience actually what is wonderful exactly, is it has exactly. happened yeah. there is there is a there is a recent memory of of of, of what that kind of um creeping stealing menacing cold that in in the novel pushes against windows, breaks windows, steals into houses. And the thresholds are really important in, in this novel uh, because the domestic space is so crucial to it. There are very often these, these movements in and out signify great, great, great transitions. And of course, there are temp temporal thresholds that are being crossed all the time. But the one, the threshold crossing that I remember best is, for those of you who know the novel, is, is, is when Will and family are all um, together on uh, Christmas Eve and then there is, a, there is a knock at the door and Mr. Metothin has turned up uh, and, and uh, wishes to speak to the, um, the, fa the father of Will. And, and this, this sudden invasion of the home space by this um, fierce and malevolent force, who of course is not Mr. Metothin but the, but the rider, uh, in disguise is just feels as you know almost as old a story as as one could have. So these moments where you you're 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 in a very specific setting and then a trapdoor opens beneath you and you fall into another time, uh, back into mythic time. Brilliant. I'd like to I'd like to talk a bit more about the, the production specifically in this collaboration, but just to acknowledge before we forget, next year will be the fiftieth anniversary of, of the book. Is that? Yeah. Yeah, f 50 years. So seven, it was published in 73, and I, 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 I like to, I've, I've said this recently, but I do think of it as a Cold War, <laughs> as a Cold War novel. Um, I do think of it as quite Le Carre-ish. It was, it was, it was, it, 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 Merriman says, this is a cold battle we are in, a cold struggle we are in, Will, and sometimes we must do cold things. And that sense of a morality, no, nothing is clean, nobody can, can get away from harm, even, even if they are aspiring to the good, feels very true of the time of its making, and still present 50 years on. I never thought of that, but absolutely the kind of rail poverty of it and the impossible decisions uh, to, to act for the best, but and, with collateral. And Will, poor Will, Will, um, this is so wonderful to have Noah here and, and present in the, in the production um, to have a young voice because the, the burden that falls on Will's shoulders is immense. Not only is he 
snatched away from his family repeatedly, doesn't know if he can ever get back, what can he tell them, has to wipe their minds. I mean, it's, it's horrendous, but also he is drawn into this murky world of, of rail politique. I think that's a really good way of putting it. And Merriman has to inculcate him into that, and it's a messy business. And there's something about the image of the, as you say, of the weight of moral responsibility falling on this very young person's mm. shoulders. Yes. Uh, when I think of the weight of moral responsibility forming, uh, falling on the shoulders of young people today as they battle for climate justice, yes. that's a very, that's a very, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, that's that's another synchronicity in this uh, particular book. Losing my microphone, yeah, so yeah. I'm just going to reclip. But absolutely, <coughs> for any of us who are parents or who work in education, I'm head of education here. That's that's very very present. Quick plug, I believe it's to be republished again with your forward next year for the 50th anniversary. Well, this is the first I heard about that, but, oh, I'm, very, okay. but, um, <laughs> but I'm very excited about it. So, um, uh, and, um, Can neither so, confirm nor deny. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if that, uh, yeah, regardless of my forward in, uh, involvement, um, the 50 year anniversary, I mean, how wonderful to have it marked. And I look forward to seeing the, the, the art as well. There's been this, uh, this kind of um, uh, dialectical tra uh, tradition of terrible covers for the novel and then <laughs> absolutely brilliant covers. Oh, and oh. <laughs> so, um, uh, this by Joe McLaren, the most recent one, I think is, 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 is wonderful. I'm less convinced by the, by the explosion in the sticker factory that this one represents. But. You can see that in all its glory on the RSA Twitter and Instagram stories as well. And so in terms of the production, Simon, was there anything yes. that um, emerged that was surprising in the process of the collaboration? It was enormous. <laughs> <laughs> it was, we said, yeah, come on, let's do it. In fact, in, in lockdown, I rang Rob and said, hey, why don't I just read it uh, over the internet? Because it's, I love reading and I love reading my children have sort of educate me by asking me to read to them and it's the most wonderful thing and I thought well during lockdown either 2020 or 2021 you know wouldn't it be wonderful to um, just read it at the right time of course it was more complicated that there are rights issues there are all sorts of things it's just not possible to do that but that's why I think in 2020 that's when the idea started to grow because uh, Rob had the previous year had done the or the 2018 I can't remember had done this read-along uh, and then uh, I mentioned this idea to uh, the producer at Complicité uh, Tim Bell who's right here in the uh, in the front and he picked the idea up and ran with it uh, and ran actually into the arms of Simon Pitts uh, who then said well we haven't spent all our budget why didn't you and we need to spend our budget by the end of the year <laughs> have it yes. uh, and <laughs> off we went we thought my god this is riches beyond compare we thought you know and we started to we gathered together a cast and we started to record it and uh, I immediately said uh, you know there are two times there's the timeless and then there is the present and I said well how can the timeless become almost more present than the present mm. time? Mm. I know, let's record the present time in, um, uh, in stereo and the timeless in binaural. Now, uh, I don't, how many people know what binaural sound is or does anyone not know? You Quite a lot of people. Good. Okay, so there's a basically, we have a head and if you shut your eyes, uh, you will start to hear voices around you, somebody scratching behind you. In other words, you can hear all around your head. When we listen to stereo, all we hear is things coming from left and right, but it's essentially flat. When we hear binaurally, you actually record it with a dummy head, and when you have headphones on, you hear what is happening as you might your own head. So in other words, it is 360 degrees, and one reason why we're very keen that people should also listen to it on the podcast is you're more likely to wear your AirPods or whatever. I mean, people are so used now to having AirPods or headphones or anything that we really felt that an vast proportion of our audience 
was going to listen to it like that. And the consequence of having it uh, binaurally is you feel in the middle of it. You are with Will when he is in the snow. You suddenly have the Dark Riders... Um, uh, 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 um, um, the, snatch, the, yeah, the, he grabs him. You can literally sort of feel his arm coming round the back of your head towards Will like that mm -hmm. and the horse seems to be sort of blowing in your ear yeah. here yeah. Um, and I mean, it, it's, it's quite disturbing oh, it's, it is uncanny <laughs> for an uncanny novel and um, uh, it, uh, Simon introduced me to binaural recording a few years ago before we um, before we worked on this together and if, if any of you have seen what, what, what's the head called a, a uh, 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 that one, that one was called Fritz. Fritz, yeah. yeah. So there's, it, it looks like a, a big steak with a head on it, like kind of impaled on the steak. Uh, so it's a, a grey human human shaped head. And Simon turned up in Cambridge <laughs> with a head on a steak. We went for a walk. And we went in for the a woods. walk around Wandlebury Woods in South Cambridgeshire, and uh, it was sort of one of us, would, <laughs> two, two of us, and a head on a steak. And um, we we. Well, we, there's some wide birds were picked past us on the path, <laughs> I think you could say. But, um, but it's but one of those things that was sort of, you know, people experimented with binaural sound in the 70s, you know, mm. work like people like Laurie Anderson and Brian Eno were making binaural recordings, but nobody was really uh, listening to them. And it was developed in the 30s or 40s mm. or 50s when people wanted to know whether you could really hear station announcements. It wasn't enough that you, you could record it and say, well, that's clear enough, or somebody just stand there going, well, I can hear that. They recorded it binaurally to see whether really the announcements were clear. Uh, but I most startlingly came across it when I met my wife Cassie because she was performing with a remarkable set of two artists, Lundel and Settel, and they had been working for some time with a dummy head and the work that they did where they guided you through and you had headphones and you felt that people were around you was all about mm. um, asking questions of your senses. What is... Because we, we assume so much about the, um, the reality, the world that we're in. We go, this is the world, this is real. My name is Simon McBurney, this is Robert McFarlane, this is how it is. And there are lots of different ways in which we can actually start to ask questions of that, of our own consciousness, um, by putting things in positions that we, un we don't expect to hear. And I think that was another reason why it seemed so appropriate to this novel, mm. because you can have a very eerie sense of being misplaced, out of time, not quite sure where you are, which is, of course, what, uh, what exactly part of the what point of, to, of, of this writing. To Will, yeah. I'll just say one more thing, which is I, I, w I wasn't in the recording studio for this, but I, I sent a video of the binaural head in the centre of the recording space. And then um, this is the where Hearn the Hunter, this kind of in immensely powerful but neutral force... Played by a wonderful actor called Miles Yakini. Yeah, who is... Uh, and, and he summons, late in the novel, he summons the wild hunt, the hellhounds, the yell hounds, and he sets them after the dark. Um, uh, and, and watching Miles summon the hounds as he circled the head, and when you hear this, you'll, you'll, you'll remember this description of it, perhaps, as he whoops and hollers, and it's this great gathering of force. And there, you could see the binaurality absolutely coming into its own. So when you listen to it, if you do listen on, pods, you'll, you'll hear Miles, he's here, he's there, he's circling, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And we should thank, among the many people to thank, is um, um, Gareth Fry, the yeah. sound designer, who, um, who you've worked with so much over the years, Simon. And well, we made a piece, yes, that is called The Encounter, Encounter which was yeah. with a binaural head, we made yeah. that together. And um, uh, so his experience in recording binaurally uh, was absolutely key and at first the sound recordist who was the overall sound recordist was extremely, who, who was very used to recording, very wonderful, wonderful sound recordist, um, uh, but he was extremely sceptical that it, it would work and, and we had to hire a studio, a special studio in order to be able to do it so there's enough room to be able to walk around it and to suddenly come close and go far away because you have a real spatial mm, sense yeah. with it. Not just a sort of, you know, 
uh, hello, good morning, yeah, how are you? Yeah. Uh, sort of feeling to it. It's um, not just pong. No, pong. that's right. <laughs> so, so, so much that we can talk about. We only have an hour. There's a couple of quick things that I would like to explore in brief before we open up and I can see questions coming in online as well. We've spoken about the sound design very powerfully. Um, Robert, is there anything you'd like to say about the role that music plays in the story oh, and yeah. in this production also? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, anyone who's read the novel uh, and I'm sure in due course anyone who listens to the adaptation will, it, it's such an acoustic novel. It's so sonically attentive, um, not, not, not just to the, eff the sort of erratic effects of the, the blacksmith's hammer tinging on the anvil or the ice crack. I mean, it's, it's wonderfully heard. And it, it does sound in the mind's ear in wonderful ways. And I think that it was very natural and in, in a way easy, to, therefore, to adapt it for what I think Simon's beautiful phrase, the, the, a theatre of the air, I think, from, mm. from deep in the, the history of the World Service. And I think that's, that's exactly what Simon and Tim and the team have created. Josh Sneesby, Gareth Fry, and others have created a theatre in the air. Um, uh, but songs are really important as well. Chants, When the Dark Comes Rising, Six Shall Turn It Back, Three from the Circle, Three from the Track. Um, carols, those are the kind of comfort songs. The, 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 and, and then there are the, the songs that get kind of distorted and, 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 and knocked out of kilter. They're, they're part of the eerie dynamism of it. And so, as well as, as, well as this brilliant musical soundscape that, that Josh and Gareth and others have created, we, I asked um, my friend Johnny Flynn if he would come in and work on some songs, some original songs for uh, the adaptation and, and kind of pull songs like Adam Lay Bounden um, or uh, White in the Moon, The Long Road Lies, which is the Houseman lyric, which is set and is sung by Will in the novel. And he brought on board these two um, amazing uh, other musicians, uh, Louisa Gerstein and Eloise tunstall Behrens. And so they've created six songs, which one of which is the dark theme, which you'll, you'll, you'll hear at the beginning and end, one of which is the light theme, which is the ethereal note that signals that the, the, the lady, one of the, the powers of the light, is there. And, uh, and, and I wrote a, a, a Hunting of the Wren song, and Johnny and I wrote a Wild Hunt song. And so we've created an EP, basically, to go, which is out tomorrow. It's called Six Signs. Uh, and those are the, so that, will, that, that, that comes out as well as a kind of honouring of the role of song, the role of chant, and the fact that words spoken and sung aloud matter in this novel. Fantastic. And as a, as a pivot and maybe a final question from me, we build this event as stories against the dark, mm. so convened around this very powerful particular story, but um, I'd been thinking about you know, that, that venerable tradition of the Christmas ghost story and convening in midwinter to tell these tales. Thinking about the RSA's heritage and Charles Dickens is a kind of key figure in this mm -hmm. space. He's uh, yeah. a former fellow. Uh, I found linkages to Arthur Conan Doyle, to Lord Dunsany as well. But is there anything about that broader tradition that either of you would like to speak to? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, well I, grew up, I grew up without a television and we didn't really listen to the radio that much, so stories at this time of year were absolutely crucial. Uh, and my upbringing was in a very extremely cold and gloomy house in the <laughs> outskirts of Cambridge, um, with mainly only open fires and no central heating. And my father uh, knew and... Uh, um, uh, uh, M. R. James. So those were absolutely part of my childhood, and wow. every Christmas there would be one of those, uh, a whistle, and I'll come to you, my mm. lad, uh, which would terrify <laughs> me, uh, and I'd have to climb the stairs with all the shadows in this house because the. For some reason, my parents thought it was good to have 15 watt light bulbs, and, so <laughs> <laughs> and it was very, very cold. Um, but happily, I shared a bedroom with my siblings, so we were all in the same room. Um, but, but uh, yeah, um, stories against uh, uh, the dark. That 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 that's absolutely. Um, uh, I mean, there's so much to say about that, but that's my 
individual story. Oh, it's how wonderful to have M.R. James sort of generationally present, a thread running through. Um, well, perhaps I'll just end this bit by taking us to the future and the story telling that we will need. Um, there's an extraordinary uh, novelist, non-fiction writer, essayist called Alexis Wright. She uh, sits in the Wanyi nation uh, in Carpentaria region of, of Australia. And I, I just think she's one of the most important writers in the world t today. Uh, and she, she, she must win the Nobel Prize. Are you listening, Stockholm? <laughs> uh, uh, and she should. And I, I read an essay that she wrote several years ago, actually. I, I don't think she's read The Dark is Rising, but you'll hear why it, it chimed. Um, because there's a, well, there's, she, she speaks of the old ones. And the old ones are the, the forces of the light. She's talking about her ancestors, Aboriginal ancestors, and she's talking about the, the forms of storytelling that we need now. So I just thought I'd read just three sentences mm. to hear Alexis's voice speaking um, from a deep, a deep um, past and to a perilous future. The world desperately needs powerful storytellers to help us make sense of the unfathomable events now taking place. Where are these future writers? Perhaps they will once again learn from the ancestors, the old ones from all over the world who kept the wisdom with them. We need to call the ancestors back to bring forth the wisdom of the ages, to help us figure out how we can be saved from ourselves. These future writers need to build, as Rilke put it, a temple for our hearing to break the poor shelters nailed up out of our darkest longings. So, wow. thank you. That's Mark. great. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful yeah, piece of writing. And I think that, uh, um, yeah, that, that is, um, yeah, f f finding the, st the, the stories that can, um, we need common stories right now because stories that reach out beyond uh, the, the tsunami of narrative information mm -hmm. but reach absolutely deeper to a, a mythic and real communality between us. Things that join us together to understand that we are not uh, as we would separate individual consumers but part of a community, mm. uh, a global community. Um, that is that is really the most wonderful piece of writing. Fantastic. It's beautiful. And for everyone in the room and at home, could you tell us the author's name again? Please? Yes, it's Alexis Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. And read anything and everything you can by that extraordinary human. Brilliant. Well, locking that into memory. And I, I think something that that co uh, quote brought out also resonates with something you said earlier, Simon, and, and in a way how this, this book, this story, and, and all of the stories in this sequence are about the salvation that can be brought by a collaboration between the elders and the ancients and the young mm. in terms of mm. yeah. how we move forward yeah. from where we are. Yeah. And I would also like to say that there are two of us sitting here, but the whole piece was made through yeah. a really huge collaboration yeah. Of, yeah. Of, of a really enormous number of people. Yeah. There was you know, a large number of people within the company that I, I'm still lucky to have, Complicite, um, Amber's here, but there are many, many, many who is uh, 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 the, the, the current, um, another producer in the company. But there, there's a really an enormous number of different uh, sound artists, not just Gareth Thry, but other people who came in, all the actors and uh, 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 engineers and producers and, uh, and also uh, actually out beyond that, um, I have to say, our, um, uh, I'm thinking of particularly of Gareth and I, as we worked uh, very late at night, our loved ones who <laughs> had to uh, put up with us starting work at kind of eight o'clock at night and still going at about two or three in the morning because it was very, very, it's a very, very complex, mm. uh, um, as, as Rob has said, it's a, a multi-layered piece. 
There are the voices, there are the words, but there are the songs, there is the music, but then there is the sound and layers of sound. Um, uh, it's really, uh, it's been an enormous undertaking uh, and what seemed to be like a vast budget at the beginning of the process ended <laughs> up seeming very small indeed. <laughs> So, we're going to go to, actually as an aside, you mentioned the Nobel Prize, somebody else would be lovely to see <laughs> wow. the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Um, going on to questions, I've got a couple beginning to emerge, just somebody saying a lot of love em emerging on the socials, people absolutely enthralled, but I've got one question online at the moment which sort of speaks to the production, it's Chloe who's watching on YouTube, hi, hi Chloe. Uh, saying, so you've, you've adapted the second book in the sequence. Uh -huh. Could you see yourselves moving back to uh, Oversea Under Stone or forward to Greenwich? Or the Grey King. <laughs> 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 let's, do, let's do all the other four, Simon. Okay. What, what are you doing for the next decade? <laughs> um, I, well, I wouldn't... I mean, Susan's work is... A good, and just to also just to name and thank Susan, who is... I hope at some point watching this, but she has been, she is an old one, and, and she is w wise and generous, and she has trusted us with this, uh, ha having um, uh, experienced, having had one experience of adaptation that was not successful. Um, it, was a, it was a great act of trust on her part, and I'm so, we're so grateful to her. But um, yes. Um, uh, I would love to adapt The Grey King. I think that's the, the Grey King is Grey incredible. King. Yeah, 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 yeah. Looking forward to that already. Then, <laughs> and so we're going to there's a hand up very, very quickly before I've even. So um, I'm actually going to go right to the back first, and please wait for the microphone to come to you. Hi, um, I think this speaks a little bit to what you were saying at the end about future writers. I think a lot of future writers will come from young <coughs> readers and there have been conversations recently about how children's literature feels like it's slipping from part of the cultural conversation. Like 30% of books in the UK are children's books that are sold, but only 3% of books media covers children's literature. Yeah. For me, <coughs> The Dark is Rising is partly, well, no, it's special because it was written for young people, not despite the fact that it was young, written for young people. And I would love to hear if that chimes with how you feel about it and how that you kind of reference that in your adaption. And also just why, hopefully, why <laughs> you feel it's important that children's literature like this is kept as a core part of the cultural conversation. Uh, can I say something? Yeah. yeah I'll just say two things very quickly. One is that I, I just think of books as written for people. That, that's how they find their way. Um, and the second is that it is really painful to see yet another huge advance go to yet another celebrity to write yet another children's book that will then absolutely dominate the, 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 the media space, it will dominate the bookshop space, and th these, these, are, these are products that are being turned off a conveyor belt, and I, I, it, it frustrates me enormously to think of work like this countless other contemporary work that's being written by astonishing writers who are writers for, to, and with children just being displaced by that. So um, I'm really glad that this conversation is happening and that there's anger out there about this now. So thank you for raising it. Mm. Um, and, and then, I, uh, this met me as a child, but it's grown with me as a, as a human. And I think that that is what and, and I know many people who've met it as, a, as, a, as, a, as an adult. I don't like to say grown up, because it sounds, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> it's exactly, here's one of them. Um, if somebody calls me childish, I, I'm just thrilled. Um, um, so, I, and, and I think, you know, great work like this meets us at any age and, and moves, moves with us and moves us as it moves with us. So, um, yeah. And, I mean, this is great writing for... Uh, young people because as I said before I think that there is a time in our lives when we're absolutely in touch with the timeless and yeah. there's yeah. something about that it's not it's not well, the interesting thing about this book for me is is it's not fantasy it's reality it's the reality of the imagination 
And the moment we get into the idea of fantasy, oh, that's fantastic, uh, I have a problem because I think the inner world is as present or perhaps more present than our outer uh, uh, tactile uh, world. And that, for me, certainly when I was mm. growing up, was my uh, home. Mm. Um, mm. Um, and, and, and that is to be... Um, there is something so children have when you are a child you, you, you are in touch with something which can um, speak to those who are no longer children who are uh, uh, and that is there's a fantastic book called the language and law of uh, school children by um, Steve Wright no Iona OP oh. Uh, um, it's uh, Language and Law of School Children by Iona, and I can't remember his name. Yeah, uh, Opie. And, and, and that's extraordinary because you understand that children have a vast and specific culture which is their own, uh, which is not, does not belong to um, uh, an adult world at all. And all sorts of, you know, it, it's a whole world and that should be um it's yeah i mean all of this this is this is where this is really education and this is what should be happening uh, for young people in schools and which of course is being as we know systematically taken away from them interesting you you know going into my my realm of of the day job uh there's a, a new consultation around a national cultural education plan refresh at the moment we all might have aspirations for that but it's really important we fight to influence that in the best way i can see you're looking for a quote rob well it was just it was just thinking about fantastical travel because it, 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 the tr to the childish imagination one can one can be in a uh, an acre of forest but it's it's, it's a wild wood the size of of the world and 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 one 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 can move between realms without questioning the movement between realms, partly because that's, and that's what metaphor does as well. Meta Aristotle calls it like unlikeness. It's the great, it's the great conjoining of the discontig discontiguous. Um, but the, I was just thinking about that moment where Will wakes uh, to, to find that the snow has fallen, everyone is asleep in the house. And actually he walks out, in, instead of going, what the hell happened here? Why are my family comatose? Uh, where did this <laughs> blizzard come from? He accepts it, and he walks out into it. Um, the strange white world lay stroked by silence. No birds sang. The garden was no longer there in this forested land. Will accepted everything that came into his mind without thought or question, as if he were moving through a dream. But a deeper part of him knew that he was not dreaming. He was crystal clear awake in a midwinter day that had been waiting for him to wake into it since the day he had been born, and for centuries before that. Wow. We'll take still time for a couple more questions. I'll come to um, the lady at the front in the barrow. <coughs> Thank you. I'm so glad you brought up Australia. Um, I'm fascinated at the moment because going through Australian Parliament, there's a big discussion about incorporating Indigenous people or First mm. Nations, and, and it's actually called the voice, the law that they're working on. And I think in the, uh, the kind of darkness that we face at the moment, that we need to look to the First Nations, not necessarily the, the people out of Oxbridge, but the First Nations people, the Sami up north, I wouldn't know how many to name, but I'll just give one example, and the, that is that the, um, the master of Jesus College, she told me that media was about stories and the old tradition from the Afro-Caribbean is stories. So very much I hope what I'm saying links in with what you're saying because it's just been... Uh, not just inspirational, but gives me hope yeah. for the future. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the comment. I think that's, there's probably nothing to add to it. It's Ooh. exactly right. We can probably double that with another question that's just come in from YouTube. So this is James Gillies, I hope I've pronounced correctly. Uh, Rob, how much has this sequence influenced your own writing on place, but I suppose also how we draw upon that deeper wisdom described? 
Well, huge thanks, James. Um, hugely uh, uh, and explicitly. I think uh, old, old Way Lane is a really crucial sort of site of power. It's where, it's where walkers have walked for, for hundreds of years. It's, um, it's where Will is safe, and as soon as he steps off Old Way Lane, uh, he, he's in trouble, he's vulnerable. So, the, um, and I wrote a book called The Old Ways, which kind of nods um, back to, to, to that. And um, my um, now 10-year-old son happens to be called Will, which may or may not entirely be a coincidence. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I think one, one thing I just want to say is that th there is a danger in the idea that we go back into the land and we extract intact myths and stories that will help us move forwards bravely into the future, because the land holds ugly stories as well as, as progressive ones. And story mm -hmm. is, an, is, is a force. It's not a... It's not an ethics. One can tell terrible stories, and terrible storytellers have brought the world to terrible places. Uh, so um, one of the things that's interesting to me is that the, the, the stories that are pulled back here, they come from all sorts of directions and times. Um, uh, it's, it's not a kind of intact, chthonic, nativist dream that you find, you find the force in the land. That's absolutely not right. It's a global vision of collaboration, community, mutualism, altruism, generosity, and decisiveness. And these are, are the hard to find and hard to live values that, are, that we need above all. So I, I, I really think it's stories are contested and renewed and revised in this novel rather than just pulled intact mm. from the mire and that seems crucial to me to, to point out. And Simon, anything around your storytelling practice um, in, in, in a different idiom you would like to speak to? Oh, um, well, um, um, I was actually thinking as Rob was talking about the um, opening of, of well, uh, I mean, m my, my practice is making theatre on the whole, but it's, I tend to think of uh, myself as a storyteller in one way or another, even if it's telling a story with a body, even if it's telling the story with an image or a sound or, or any of those things. Um, <coughs> but I was thinking, and I don't have my phone here, so I can't actually read the quote. I haven't, I haven't prepared, like Rob. Oh God, <laughs> I'm not prepared. Um, uh, um, but John Berger says in a very beautiful book called "And Our Faces, My Heart, Brief as Photos," uh, he be begins a, a, a sequence called storytelling, which is um, we are all storytellers lying on our backs we look up at the night sky this is where all stories began mm. under the aegis of stars which at night filch certitudes and sometimes return them as faith mm. um, and there's something about that about the fact that stories begin in a in, in a space which is larger than our own and there's something about the, the, the power of stories to encompass an, a, a space which is larger than the local and the particular. And the malevolence of stories is when they, when, when, when they start to divide uh, uh, and reduce. Mm. Um, mm. And the power of stories is when they connect uh, and enlarge. Amazing. And I think that's, that's a perfect note to end on. Um, just to say, it's been absolutely fascinating. Can't wait, I think, like everybody, to listen to this production over the coming 12 days. Please listen to the podcast. Uh, there's, there are three versions currently out, aren't there, Rob? I think there are 15, but I, I lost it. Lost, <laughs> no, yes. There are, so there's the BBC World Service... Um, uh, uh, which is broadcast. about 17 and a half minutes long each episode. And then there's the uh, uh, BBC World Service podcast. Uh, and which is then, a bit longer. And then there is the Radio 4 running four omnibus episodes, each around 40, 44, 44 minutes. 44 minutes, yeah. yes, Brilliant. which is a little bit more reduced. 
That's on the 26th, does that start? Yes. yes. Yeah. yes. And we've, we've shared the details for anyone watching online in the chat also. And again, uh, I think it's, it's probably going to become very active. The dark is rising as a social media hashtag. It's not just us connecting with, with it through that. Yep. Yep. So thank you again to Rob and Simon for this amazingly rich conversation. And thanks to Amber and the team at Complicite for their help in making today possible. It's actually our last RSA event of the year. So thanks to everyone who's contributed to the programme over 2022. Not only to fantastic speakers like Rob and Simon, everyone that's worked on the programme more broadly, and of course to all of our visitors, guests, fellows uh, who support uh, our vital uh, mission, World Changing Ideas for Free for Everyone. We'll be back in the early new year with a brand new set of inspiring and thought-provoking events uh, to help us try and make sense of the collective challenges and creative opportunities that are in store for 2023. For now, thank you and goodbye to our online audience. Uh, to everyone else here, actually you're very welcome to stay on. We're going to be having mulled wine and a mince pie in here <laughs> and on the foyer. Sorry for people online. Thanks again to <laughs> Rob and, and Simon and Happy holidays and keep warm and well, everybody, whether you're here or online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.